Um, so I'm delighted to move on to our third keynote. We have Professor uh, Bruce Langford here, um, Chair of the Irrigation and, and Water Forum, um, and a Professor uh, of Water and Irrigation Policy at the School of International Development, um, University of East Anglia, UEA. Um, and uh, those of you who, who follow irrigation, uh, particularly in Africa, will know that Bruce was um, author of the 2005 Five. Commission for Africa uh, report on um, irrigation um, and, and food production in Africa. And, um, and I think this is going to be your sort of starting point now, Bruce, yeah. so kind of looking, looking back and looking forwards um, from that. So, um, yeah, thanks, Bruce. Over okay, to you. Great. And thank you for inviting me. Um, Okay, quick apologies to the master's students that are here. This is a slight recover of um, one of the lectures that I give to them. Okay. Um, I've used the Commission for Africa experience as a way to sort of throw some caution on the idea of how we expand and sustain irrigation if we're going to use surface water and groundwater. Um, and writing the Commission for Africa report was also a an example of how you can be mistaken for somebody who is an expansionist or an irrigationist or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I was sent a terms of reference to and 10 days of consultancy to come up with the idea that uh, the Co Commission for Africa should support the doubling of irrigation in Africa within a 10-year uh, span. Um, so that would have been 2000, probably 2006 to 2016. Okay, so, I'm, and I'm not, I'm, I'm slightly more sort of critical thinking than somebody who thinks that you can double the area of irrigation in Africa relatively easily. Um, the photograph on the slide, and I s always set the master's students the same question, which is, what is this showing? What it is, is a little bamboo aquifer that a farmer's put up. It's very, very clever. The farmer is ferrying water from across a ravine. On the other side of that ravine, which is tree-lined, is the surface canal that is then supplying a command area further down the valley on the left-hand side of the photograph. So the farmer has ferried a little bit of water using a bamboo pipe and an aqueduct. And to me, this is everything that you need to know about how farmers are interested in getting hold of water and are quite innovative around that. And what they're doing, of course, at the same time, is they're using gravity and not pumps, because pumps cost money, and both in electricity or diesel, and in terms of, particularly when we think of farmers as collective, uh, a collective endeavour, farmers that then have got to organise themselves around maintaining a pump if it's going to supply a group of farmers. And that causes as a collective endeavour, a lot of problems for farmers, how they maintain collective systems. So my thesis, of course, is that maintaining a collective surface gravity system is a lot easier than a pump system. So another note of caution. The themes that crop up with uh, irrigation policy won't be news to you. I mean, this is about uh, not only expanding, but it's also to do with productivity, it's to do with whether we go into new build or whether we rehabilitate existing systems. Uh, it's about the choice of technology that we employ. It's then about choices around ownership and institutions. Um, it's also about how we might deliver that at an appropriate price. And to date, donors have consistently brought in irrigation support programs at a relatively eye-watering cost of about 10,000 US dollars per hectare or more. In fact, there are some case examples from Malawi and Swaziland which are double and treble that. So we have a tendency in the irrigation world to make uh, projects extremely expensive. And not only do we sort of think about the technology of providing water, it's also where do we get that water from? And I think that's what's important about today, which is this highlighting of the fact that we have this other resource, groundwater. And then, of course, what happens is with irrigation sitting in river basins is it establishes immediately an allocation problem, which is how do we allocate water to irrigation systems and environmental flows and domestic use and growing cities and so on and so forth. 
Um, so I was uh, invited to... The terms of reference were very interesting for the Commission for Africa. I was invited to think widely and deeply about irrigation. Um, <coughs> and that's... I felt I was an appropriate person for that because I enjoy thinking comprehensively about irrigation. Um, so we set about that and I, we employed a master student to help me crunch some of the numbers. And um, we discovered using FAO statistics that current growth um, was, about one, was about between one and two percent per annum, which is quite significant um, in terms of growth. What the Commission for Africa wanted to do was to double that, or in some cases treble it. They wanted to go from one to two percent up to four percent and over. The question, of course, that one asks is: Is that uh, environmentally sustainable, and is it socially um, sustainable? And again, referring back to my first slide with the bamboo aqueduct, is that how do you? add on additional incentives to situations where farmers are already extremely keen to add irrigation to their farming systems. And it's that additional sort of policy instrument of um, bringing technologies that farmers are already keenly interested in, the collective scale, which I think is the, the policy challenge. The tendency, I think, is to go down um, very expensive routes without without meshing with farmers' own resource the farmers' own resources, financial resources, and the f and the artisanal skills that exist uh, for providing engineered solutions to water control. I think we too often go to the to the uh, commissioning of irrigation systems using relatively expensive engineers um, from Europe. So what I submitted as a report, and this is all available on uh, my UEA website, was we analyzed the existing setup up to 2005, and then I provided what I called a comprehensive framework. In fact, I, I could only see that you could double the area of, under, of irrigation in within 10 years by not putting all your eggs into one basket. In other words, you should not only do rainwater harvesting, or not only small-scale systems, or not only borehole systems, but everything. It, you had to you had to undergo a comprehensive approach to deliver anything like a doubling of irrigated area. And um, I drew up a diagram, which is not been particularly well represented on the PowerPoint slide, but essentially I thought the comprehensive approach could be cast as technologies, which are on the right-hand side, um, by various supportive um, thematic programs to do with research, capacity building, financial tools and management, which are the circles in the center. And at the bottom, we would then look at the sort of political economy of irrigation. So what are the economic drivers? What are the mediating institutional and legal factors? Um, what exists at the international level? And what sort of basin programs are going on at the same time? And then one would also nest irrigation systems within catchments, within larger catchments within river basins. So I, that was my framing, which was multiple nested, multiple technologies, and multiple way of seeing the way that irrigation systems uh, behave as a, as a way that they, in the way that they reflect a wider economy or a wider environment. <coughs> to me, this is not surprising. However, uh, the great challenge for me was the difference between what I submitted, which I saw was an eminently rational approach, and then what the Commission for Africa put down on paper. They completely neglected the idea that there might be an existing trajectory of irrigation uptake. They seemed to sort of think that Africa was bereft of irrigation and that they would somehow, through the Commission for Africa, would be the, it would be the sole instrument by which you could then increase irrigation as opposed to this idea that you might take an already existing se expanding sector and figure out how to maneuver that around. Uh, there was no mention of a comprehensive approach. They set this excessive doubling target, which I wasn't very happy with, and they emphasized greatly only very small-scale systems. In fact, I then, I've taken out some of the slides that I've included 
but um, I've pinpointed some of the texts that you can uh, read in the glossy book, which is available to download as a PDF, which sort of supports my argument that they effectively ignored the uh, advice that I gave them, which came from their own terms of reference. Um, so here they are emphasizing small-scale irrigation as a means to double irrigation. I just uh, don't mind sharing with you some uh, email traffic. Um, and I, again, I've abridged this from the much more interesting email traffic that I had with them. They wrote to me and said, we almost certainly have to go for a doubling of irrigation um, and a 50% increase in the first five years. And then I, the next slide was a very long slide, but I cut that down. And I said, well, this is not something I can sign up to. It's very difficult, but I could sign up to a doubling of benefits. So in other words, how do you increase yields? That's one way. How do you increase area, which is another way. How do you increase access to irrigated land? So very small plots, perhaps um, uh, very small irrigated gardens for uh, young farmers, for female farmers, for elderly farmers. So in other words, how do you share out irrigated land? And I said, maybe we should um, concentrate on benefits rather than area. And they wrote back to me and said, nope, uh, we want to double the area because it's easier to sell to the public. And they then had brought to bear their evidence, which was behind their uh, point of view, which was that they're going to double the area under irrigation. Here is a submission from a practitioner in Africa whose figures seem to show that theoretically doubling is possible if we use micro-irrigation. And the company data that was sent to me was m the money maker treadle pump uh, from Tanzania and Kenya. And they had a little Excel file which showed, sure enough, the sales of the treadle pump was exponentially beginning to increase as a result of Moneymaker promulgating this technology. So now we have a major British initiative, uh, the Commission for Africa, being advised by a company selling treadle pumps that the way to double the area under irrigation in Africa is to use treadle pumps, which I thought was a bit of a conflict of interest going on there. But So in the end, the and I've seen this elsewhere, and I'm sure you have too, which is that this, the Commission for Africa departure point was this idea that there's this enormous potential for irrigation in Africa. So rather than the existing trajectory and the existing statistics telling us the way to go, it's actually this idea of where can we get to, this idea of potential, which really worries me. And a little bit, an almost anecdotal evidence around pedal pump sales. And I think this kind of... Um, ambition and uh, desire to grow irrigation is reflected uh, in different ways uh, in the last 10 years. And I don't think that was just only at the Commission for Africa where we saw a rather stark example of that. So the question, I w the question we have to ask is who provides the burden of proof? And who sees, given the fact that I've just chaired a meeting in London recently on canal irrigation, who sees that canal and surface irrigation is an appropriate low carbon and appropriately collective technology if we can uh, get it to perform better? <coughs> and uh, I've got two, Alan, Nickel, and Lila are here. So um, they cite a blue revolution. I know that we now have a blue green revolution mm -hmm. from this morning. Um, so they, they cite uh, Lavelle in 1996, who picks up types of water control technologies that um, seem appropriate, they seem sensible. The Schumachian school is here, the small is beautiful. Um, but the challenge, to my mind, is, is this conception about supplementary irrigation. And I wonder whether we can uh, reverse this idea that supplementary irrigation is not about bringing irrigation to where we have breaks in the rain. In other words, not about applying blue water to green water to solve the problem of meteorological droughts and agricultural droughts. It's actually about uh, where we provide irrigation systems that then the, the rainfall tops up the irrigation, the crop water need. In other words, it's the other way around. It's green water on top of blue water, which is supplemental.
because I think once you begin to bring blue water, it, and this is the point that Tony and I have referred, is that farmers will use up <coughs> large amounts of water uh, and we throttling that back, regulating irrigation abstraction is very difficult once you set up the infrastructure. So this idea that you can have perhaps just a, a small deficit of say 100 millimetres or 150 millimetres of crop water requirement and that somehow you can put in the irrigation technology just to top up that 150 millimetres doesn't seem right to my mind. It's actually, it's more likely the case that you're going to be applying 600 millimetres and the rainfall will top up say 150 millimetres. So that's the real challenge is how we conceive the relationship to, I mean, Alan's very important idea of the blue and green circles, it's, but it's the sequencing of that that's very important. So the greatest mistake I made with the Commission for Africa report, and again, the master students already know the answer for this one, is that I didn't include a photograph of a system because even this very small scale system in <laughs> southern Tanzania would be 2,000 peddlers. Uh, and of course, more than three or four thousand years ago, humans worked out that the way to bring up water from two or three meters was to use animal power, not human power, or to use gravity. Um, so that would have been uh, a very difficult. I, you know, you have to imagine how the Commission for Africa would want to see the doubling of irrigation using treadle pumps. It, it beggars the imagination. Anyway, so the question is, how do we interpret the policy challenge of many small-scale systems when the cumulative area is above 12 million hectares? So it's that ability to hold within your mind the idea of very small-scale systems that cumulatively become very large, the coalesced problem. And this, of course, is picked up elsewhere, so I'll just finish on the idea that uh, the challenge of providing irrigation in the savannah areas of Africa uh, also cropped up in the World Bank report, Awakening Africa's Sleeping Giant. Uh, and then, just to summarize a couple of bullet points, the success stories do exist in sub-Saharan Africa. We, ne we, need, we need to research them. We need to find out where they are and how they tick. There's a tremendous sort of risk, however. The environment is extremely challenging getting groundwater up from uh, depths of, say, 10 metres and going via a sprinkler or centre pivot route, you then have to add another 30 metres of water pressure on top of that, uh, which is expensive. Um, so we have to think about how we're going to provide enough electricity for groundwater irrigation. Um, we have ch multiple views on the technologies, what is the most appropriate. Um, I don't think the, the depth of expertise to reflect on this cautiously is necessarily very available in Africa. I think there's a lot of people who are rushing towards solutions that seem, um, predict seem sensible, S whether it be treadle pumps or center pivots or even canal irrigation. They all have to be taken on board very cautiously, I think. Um, what I didn't spot in 2005 was the role of the, the, the growing role of the private sector and, and particularly foreign investors. Um, I think that's really come on board very strongly since then and of course uh, 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 China as well and, and some of the Middle Eastern investors as well. Um, and again, this, the, the, the silent question that always comes alongside irrigation investment is this question of allocation. How at the same time are we going to regulate demand. Um, and bearing in mind that we've got some very large growing medium-sized towns in Africa, we should be perhaps conserving groundwater resources to provide for those um, towns rather than for irrigated agriculture. I did some calculations on Alan's second and third slide. Uh, there's in terms of water for irrigation, there's not, even though you suggested there was a lot of water that, that, to my mind, there isn't. That's because irrigation is tremendously depletive of water. Um, so finally, yes, I've gone back to that idea of governing the coalesced areas. Um, a lack of critical knowledge now to support farmers. Um, how, do we how do we get the ownership of these new systems uh, working and ticking along? They're using their own funds to build them and sustain them. 
what will be the institutional framework of new build and of rehabilitated systems? What is the entry point for expanding irrigation? Um, who do we go to? Is it the farmers themselves? Is it Chinese investors? Is it uh, governments? Is it Oxfam? Is it our taxpayer money via DFID? Very interesting questions. And then um, defining both the supply side, you know, what, what is the source? Is it groundwater? Is it further dam building? Uh, and then how do we match that with um, irrigation command areas that don't, de don't deplete that resource, particularly when these systems switch from being wet season to dry season or from, from being, um, you know, normal hydrological year to being a, a drought year. That, that is a very challenging uh, condition, which is, uh, and we should see that as relatively normal in semi-arid sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that those environments do th throttle back with lack of water. And I think this question of how we use groundwater to sustain production during natural semi-arid variability uh, is a very interesting question. I think that's it. Yeah, I that's it. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, great presentation. Um, and some some good food for thought there. Also interesting to you know to look back on the on your on your input to the Commission for Africa and to see some more you know UEA emails out in, out in the public, <laughs> public domain. Very leaky. <laughs> yeah. um, now what I would suggest we do, since we're we're running a little bit um, over, um, uh, which is okay because we have some squish in the program um, a little bit later. Uh, but what I suggest we do now is run straight through to Karen Vilhoth because these two presentations from Bruce and, and Karen really link quite nicely together. Um, so hold your comments and questions for the, for the moment, I think. Um, Karen, are you with us? Yes, I am. Roger. Hi, Karen. Great, and thank you for joining us on what is um, a public holiday, I think, in, in South Africa. Let me just uh, introduce you. Um, so, Karen, um, a principal researcher on groundwater management uh, for IMI, International Water uh, Management Institute, um, based in uh, Pretoria, so that's the Southern Africa office of, of IMI. Um, and uh, you know a long-standing interest in in groundwater development, groundwater management, and also um, um, small-scale um, groundwater-based irrigation, which she's published on fairly recently. I think in in Water International there was a special edition. Correct me if I'm wrong, Karen. No, it's not correct. Good, and I think you'll be dealing with um, you know the results of of some of that work in your in your presentation. So. Um, Karen, I think we are set up with your uh, presentation on the screens here. Everybody uh, can see it clearly, so uh, over to you. Okay, thank you, Raja, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, event, uh, which I think is very relevant uh, for the World Water Day, talking about groundwater and uh, food security, basically, in Africa. Um, Yes, I agree totally with what you say, that uh, I will be sort of presenting on some of the recent work that uh, IMI has been involved in on uh, groundwater in uh, basically sub-Saharan Africa, so I will focus on that region. And uh, if you go straight to the next slide, uh, I will start off with sort of acknowledging some of the work that has been done that I actually haven't been much involved in, but I sort of caught up and done some synthesis of that work. Uh, so we have two projects. One is what we call the Rockefeller Project, which was basically f uh, focusing on groundwater for irrigation in uh, Sub-Saharan sub Africa. And the second one was a little broader, not only looking at groundwater, but more broadly at uh, water management uh, solutions in agriculture for smallholders. Um, so the output of those uh, is, is basically what I will be addressing, and then of course also some of my my own work related uh, to that. So if you go to the next slide, this will give sort of an overview of, of my presentation. So I have uh, decided to to go through these kind of four or five axes of the uh, topic. Uh, first of all, the drivers and the potential. So the drivers are more the socioeconomic uh, factors. 
uh, driving groundwater irrigation in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and then the potential here, I'm talking more about the physical potential. Um, and then on the other side, which sort of uh, constrains uh, the development of groundwater irrigation at present, uh, both in terms of the socioeconomics and also in terms of um, yeah the physical limits. I might be um, also sort of pointing to some of the points that uh, Bruce uh, were pointing to, so I hope I won't be overlapping too much. Anyway, let's go to the first slide, or the next slide, please. So uh, first of all, talking about the drivers, um, I think there's a big sort of internal driver um, from the uh, inherent properties of groundwater uh, that is sort of being uh, recognized by the farmers at present, and that is that it's it's quite uh, ubiquitous in many places, so it's quite f easy to get access to if you have the technical means uh, to do so. Um, it uh, has its own sort of built-in distribution system because you can drill wherever you find uh, your need for using the water, and it also has its own inbuilt storage, which uh, then gives very good opportunity for local uh, use of the resource. You don't need any uh, damming or anything like that. Um, it also provides quite good uh, water control because of these issues. And oftentimes it's found that the efficiency, the irrigation efficiency and the productivity uh, from groundwater use is, is higher than when you use other types of water like surface water. So that's also a very uh, in good incentive for using it. Another very important point is that the groundwater is available all year round. And, and for many farmers, this is the major point. We, uh, Bruce already talked about supplementary irrigation, but during the droughts and during dry seasons, uh, groundwater will oftentimes be the only available resource, and then it can mean a huge uh, difference for farmers that don't have other uh, sources of income if they can have uh, irrigation during these times and make uh, a profit. Um, and then it's uh, relatively drought resilient, uh, which of course is part of the, uh, part of the same um, point that I made. And then the final thing is that there's individual access and management, and that is very important. We have seen that in, in uh, Asia very much, that farmers actually prefer to have their own access to the water. They don't have to ask for getting access to the canals and, and having their share in the water and so on. So it's, it's totally privately controlled, and that's a big advantage for the farmers. Uh, besides uh, these points, there's also some s more socioeconomic drivers that are seen now, and that is that there's increasing demand for horticulture crops, uh, for instance, for growing urban areas and so on. And uh, it seems like uh, these small plots uh, for the uh, small farmers are very suitable for these uh, crops, and so it's also quite a good uh, argument for, for groundwater irrigation. Um, and also, yeah, maybe in the longer term for food security, but that's something we can discuss later. And there's also better access and better uh, uh, pumps available today and lower cost pumps that uh, farmers can get access to. And that's part of what was investigated in these projects. And pumps are used for many things, not only for groundwater, but of course for groundwater they are almost always uh, necessary. And then uh, as a last point, I think it's very important to point out that uh, until now there has not been much attention from governments and donors in terms of groundwater irrigation. But as we saw uh, from the interview with the, with the uh, Ethiopian uh, minister, there's increasing um, interest and, and focus on what the role of groundwater can be in uh, groundwater irrigation and agricultural growth. Um, and this is... Uh, I think uh, all over uh, Africa, but of course more so in some countries than others. And I think Ethiopia is one of the front runners in this in this uh, <coughs> respect. And um, you can go to the next slide, and then I'll talk a little about the positive socioeconomic aspect that we have found uh, from some of the studies, and that is that groundwater is often the preferred water source, and that's kind of what I've already alluded to, uh, and that's also for f for female farmers. So uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, female-headed households that are also using groundwater and, and making a good profit uh, from that. So it's also sort of poverty alleviating and, and making more equity in terms of access to water and agricultural business. Um, <clears throat> what some specific results is that farmers in Ghana that used uh, groundwater with manual uh, sort of means obtained larger uh, net revenue per area irrigated than any of the other irrigation types that were investigated. 
So in, in, in many cases, actually, they make more money when they use groundwater compared to other sources. Um, and that was also find, found in uh, similar studies in Malawi. And as we already discussed, the treadle pumps, uh, where they have been accepted by farmers, and that's not everywhere, but for instance, in Malawi, they're quite popular. And there it's found that the users are better off than the non-adopters. And then, for instance, like in, in Ghana, where we've done quite a bit of work in the northern part, uh, it is seen that, especially during the dry season, uh, the distress <laughs> migration uh, by the farmers, especially by the men, have been reduced because now they have a steady income due to pr production of, for instance, tomatoes and so on. So it has quite a bit of socioeconomic impact. Going to the next slide, some of the sort of uh, backside uh, to that, and, and, and that's again addressing uh, the women and also the poorest farmers, because in many cases, uh, getting access to groundwater requires some uh, technologies, it requires some knowledge, and so on. And uh, in many cases, that is uh, what uh, women is disadvantaged in terms of. And so, um, of course, as I mentioned, they have advantage, but they have to struggle a lot uh, to be in there. And, and, and not enough is done to get them on board, uh, like uh, making sure that they have uh, equal access to land tenure, to financial resources, um, and to the technical skills, for instance, that are needed to, to use groundwater. So there's a lot of work to be done there, and, and it has to be targeted if you want to get the, uh, the female farmers on board as well. Um, and then I'll talk a little about the existing, the next slide, sort of um, the, in, the ex, uh, existing conditions for groundwater irrigation. You can go to the next slide. Um, this just briefly shows you a map where you can see sort of the discrepancy between Asia and Africa in terms of groundwater irrigation. So in Africa, it's about 1% of the irrigated or the cultivated land. In Asia, it's up to 14%. Um, percent. And in India that you see here, it, it's actually much higher. So uh, inevitably, there's, a, there's an unused potential. I think we all agree on that. We can then discuss how much it is. Um, next slide, please. We did some assessments of uh, the current uh, extent of groundwater irrigation in Sub-Saharan Africa based on some country studies. And we updated uh, previous data. And what we saw was that uh, actually there's quite an increase uh, happening at present, uh, mostly through smallholder farmers is, is what we see. So it's, it's basically through private initiatives by small farmers that see the opportunity and the benefits of using groundwater. And here we have compared with India, the trajectory of India from back in the 1950s. And you can see that the, the increase rate may be comparable to when it sort of took off in India. And then we can always discuss what, what are the further trajectories in sub-Saharan Africa. If you go to the next slide, you can see the absolute no the figures. And you can see that's the green numbers, and you can see that uh, we're still at a very low absolute level in sub-Saharan Africa. We are maybe to 2 million uh, hectares altogether, and it's a very low number still. But things are happening, and it's something that we really have to address now and, and, and uh, understand a lot more about to be able to uh, support. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see sort of um, the, <coughs> the differences between the, the different countries, how much groundwater is being used for irrigation. You can see South Africa is quite high, and that's basically because of quite uh, large-scale irrigation schemes from groundwater, uh, as opposed to many of the other countries where a lot of it is from smallholder farmers. And these figures may actually uh, be partly underestimated because these are fair data, and, and they are not always up to date in capturing these uh, smallholder schemes. Uh, next slide. To kind of get an overview of what kind of uh, irrigation uh, we're talking about from groundwater. Uh, I tried to, to put the, this matrix up that has kind of a four different types of uh, groundwater irrigation. And on one axis, it's uh, the depth of the groundwater that is used, and the other one is the source of funding for it. You could use other uh, uh, criteria for, for making a typology, but these I found were quite useful and, and quite descriptive. On the next slide, I'll just briefly give some examples. So the first one was the commercial uh, sort of uh, use of groundwater through uh, deep groundwater. This is an example from Ethiopia where they grow flowers uh, from deep groundwater and they export it to, to Europe. And this is uh, very efficient and very uh, costly. Or, or it's a very uh, good income from this. Uh, the second one is uh, the informal, small-scale, farmer-driven 
you can go to the next slide, um, groundwater irrigation. And ex the example shown here is from uh, northern Ghana that I mentioned before with the tomato growers. And you can see here that it's very shallow groundwater. Sometimes the wells are even uh, temporary. They re-dig them every year because they, dig they have been uh, uh, digged into the, into the river sediments, basically. Um, this is very uh, uh, rudimentary, very uh, la la labor intensive, and uh, yeah, but still the farmers make, make uh, a good living out of that. Uh, type three, the next one, is also deep groundwater, but um, in this case it's uh, publicly uh, uh, financed. So these, this is also an example from Ethiopia. So they are drilling deep wells, but it's uh, targeted towards the smallholder farmers. So uh, the farmers get very small plots uh, with irrigation, and they can grow crops as well. But it's quite costly. I will come back to some of the figures for the price or the costs involved. The, the fourth type, um, which is also shallow groundwater uh, and smallholder farmers, but it's uh, financed by, uh, by donors or government. And it's an example from Nigeria. Maybe you've heard about the Fatima systems there, where uh, the farmers are getting uh, small plots again, but from shallow groundwater. And this has been quite successful, actually. It's been going on for maybe 20 years now. If you go to the next one, some costs involved. And uh, uh, Bruce already gave some figures saying that we should go below 2,000 US dollars per hectare. And you can see this is only happening for the last uh, category here, where we're talking about these Fatima systems, the others, where you do deep uh, groundwater drilling, that's when it becomes very costly. So you have to think about that when you uh, design your schemes and decide what are the best options. Usually the very deep schemes have become uh, very much more costly. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. I will talk a little more about the potential. And you can go to the next one. So we did a little bit of uh, um, sort of uh, literature review and found that, uh, uh, yeah, I said that uh, there's only little, um, there's a little uh, use, but a huge potential. Um, and uh, you can see here there were some estimates from the World Bank that less than 20% of the renewable supplies are used. And uh, uh, there was an assessment by uh, you, et al., and they come, came up with up to 16 million hectares for small scale irrigation as a potential in Sub Saharan Africa. And the last two points are some work that I have been involved in myself. So first one is doing some uh, assessments at the country level where we came up with an uh, assessment of up to 4 million hectares per country in 13 different sub-Saharan African countries. And then the last one, which I will dwell a little more into, is uh, looking at a grid-based assessment uh, where we came up with additional 43 uh, million hectares all over Africa could be irrigated uh, by groundwater, which is a huge amount. But let, let's move to the next slide, and I'll explain you a little more about we um, we basically use the the recharge uh, from a groundwater uh, from a, a a model, a global uh, hydrological model. We use the the recharge component as the upper uh, limit to uh, to to the use uh, for irrigation. But we accounted also for the uses uh, for other uh, demands for domestic, for livestock, for industry, and so on. And subtracted that, and so we and we also accounted for the environment. You can see there are three different scenarios here. So uh, we assumed that uh, 30 up to 70 percent of the recharge was going to the environment, and then the excess of that when, were then allocated for potential irrigation, and we accounted for the cropland and the various uh, crops across uh, Africa, which were the most uh, prevalent crops, and what were their irrigation needs, and then. We came up with a gridded uh, map of uh, the groundwater irrigation potential. Next slide, I have just summarized something. I'll come back to a map later, if you can see that. So what we came up with was kind of a ranking of which countries were mostly uh, have higher potential in terms of groundwater irrigation. Uh, from Kenya, which have uh, Mali, Niger, and South Africa, Tanzania mm -hmm. have low potential. Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Ghana, Malawi, Mozambique, Nigeria, and Zambia have quite appreciable uh, still uh, potential. And then some countries have even larger potential, but maybe it's not really uh, so much needed at present because they use a lot of surface water at present. If you go to the next slide, I'm coming back to the maps. And what we, do, what we did here was actually subtract uh, the potential that we came up with in terms of uh, irrigated land. 
and we subtracted the existing uh, groundwater irrigation in Africa, and you can see where there's still um, a uh, unused potential or uncommitted groundwater irrigation potential, and those are the green areas. Where you see the red areas, that's where there's no more potential because it's already being irrigated or because there's uh, not much cropland or because um, because there's no uh, significant recharge. So that gives a pretty good uh, indication of where the potential is. And, and of course, this is basically based on a hydrological approach, and, and we have to look also at the socioeconomic factors and the hydrogeological factors, which will be something we uh, will try to do in the next phase of this work. If you go to the next slide, you can see that there's a lot of uncertainty related to recharge. These are estimates from two sources. So one is from FAIR, one is from, a, again, a world uh, uh, model of hydrology. And you can see in some countries they differ quite a bit. And since we have used some of these data, it also tells you <laughs> that there is quite uh, uncertainty related to this still. And also for the uh, variability of recharge, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that, uh, of course, recharge varies uh, quite a lot across the country, uh, across uh, the whole continent. But significantly, on the right-hand side, we have uh, plotted the coefficient of variability. And what you can see is where the groundwater is needed the most. It's also where the recharge is most variable and unpredictable in a way. So then the question is, how big if the, is, the bus, is the buffer that you have in your groundwater system? And that, I think that's where we need to do significantly more research. Is the variability uh, not influencing your access and your availability of groundwater? That is the question. Okay, coming to the constraints, um, the next slide, please, yeah, and then uh, what we did was try to sort of link some of the, or, or list some of the constraints that were uh, important for groundwater, and we used the kind of food value chain, and what we like to, to emphasize is that we, we like to see groundwater as kind of one of the inputs. If you, go, if you click once, you can see that I just added the groundwater here as a, as a as a separate kind of component of the food value chain, because many cases when you look at the food value chain, they forget about the water. And so I think we need to emphasize that when we do an, our analysis. And in the next slide, you can see how we sort of dwelled in on the groundwater aspect. So to see that actually you have your own sort of value chain for the groundwater. So you need the groundwater resource, you need the wells, you need the pumps, and you need some power or energy to, to get access to it. And that has to be looked at separately. You also need to look at the, the policies uh, related to groundwater and, and extension services and so on. If all of these things are in place, then groundwater development can go forward. But it's not enough. You also have to look at the other ones that are sort of related to the general uh, development in terms of infrastructure and uh, agricultural development uh, for inputs and so on. So all of these things have to come together to make it uh, successful. In the next slide, you can see a map uh, from Tanzania in the upper part of the upper Ruaha Basin, uh, where we did some uh, field work uh, in an area where groundwater is not used at all at present for irrigation. All the green spots here are only surface uh, water irrigation schemes. But some of these uh, smaller um, uh, communities, they didn't have any access to water if they were downstream. And so they would very much benefit from getting access to groundwater. And so we were looking at why didn't they use this? What was the reason? Because the groundwater was just under their feet. And what we found was that, uh, they, first of all, they couldn't get access to pumps, and they didn't know uh, how to drill the wells. Uh, they didn't do it, at least. So uh, it was not about knowledge and awareness about the resource. Um, also, there was, they were very poor people, and they had uh, not good opportunities for getting credit. Uh, uh, loans and so on to, to uh, invest in, in groundwater irrigation. And as I said, the training was also lacking. So they, these were the major constraints in this area. Whereas the energy was not a problem, policies were also sort of uh, uh, favorable to, to groundwater development. The markets were there, it was easy to sell their stuff and so on. So that was not a problem. So we sort of tried to identify the most uh, in, uh, critical barriers to groundwater development. Next slide. Oh, actually, you should have gone on to the next one. Sorry, I didn't follow that. But here you can just see which kind of linked uh, the, the constraints in, in, in groundwater related and non groundwater related. And both of them were sort of important in, in, in this uh, question. Uh, yes, for this sunflower pump, I think we have to look at uh, other types of getting access to groundwater that are maybe not uh, dependent on uh, fossil fuels. So this is one option that we're looking into with some partners. 
The next thing is uh, the next slide. Uh, manual drilling is something that is also, I think, uh, a potential that has to be developed further for the poor people because drilling is quite expensive otherwise. The last uh, part of my talk is about the limits. And you can move to that last slide. Um, uh, and the next slide just shows you uh, sort of if you're looking at a smallholder family, how much water they need, you can just click everything on there. Um, going from the bottom, from domestic use to livestock, typically uh, what they need is yeah, maybe double of, of the domestic use. And then for uh, irrigation, it's maybe up to 8,000 liters per day for, for, for the crops. So you can see it's a huge step up in terms of uh, water needs once you move away from rain-fed uh, agriculture. And of course, it has uh, implications, as uh, Bruce was uh, mentioning earlier. And I think that it is an issue we have to, to deal with. Next slide. Um, and, and as he also mentioned, is the fact that groundwater irrigation is not easily controlled and managed, uh, especially when you have all these uh, smallholder uses. And that has been seen like in, in Asia. Um, and we may have competitive expansion. And this could threaten the resource base, the environment, as well as domestic uses, which is very critical. So some of the uh, considerations we have to come up with is, is I think we need to do much more uh, pre-feasibility uh, to understand where are the actual potentials and what are the limits. And we also have to follow after the uh, development. We need to know some of the impacts, both in terms of the socioeconomic but also in terms of the resource. And then the training and the organization of the farmers become important. It's a huge issue. I don't know how we can address it because there are so many farmers and it takes time to train them and so on. But uh, this has to come into Water Users Association through the extension services and so on. And they have to be capacitated to, to support the farmers. Uh, and we have to think of if we can uh, enhance the, the recharge through simple means uh, from rainfall, from flood water and so on. Yes, I think that I will conclude now. And the next slide. Um, so what what I sort of tried to cover in my talk here, and I'm sorry, I've been talking quite quickly, mm -hmm. but uh, um, what we have seen is that groundwater irrigation by smallholders is on the rise in sub-Saharan Africa, but still at a relatively low level compared to other regions in the world. Uh, but still, it enhances livelihoods and possibly secures food. Uh, but that's something that we haven't looked very much at. And of course, it becomes an issue whether the farmers can uh, secure their own uh, food or it just becomes uh, market crops that are sold or it becomes energy crops or whatever. But that's something I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done to understand this better. Uh, however, groundwater irrigation is very labor intensive or capital intensive if you don't, uh, if you have to take pumps and so on. And that means that it requires dedicated efforts to further support women and poorest farmers and, and hence ensure poverty alleviation. Otherwise, you still lose uh, all the poorest farmers. Um, and they have to be organized, the farmers, in terms of uh, being custodians of their own resources. And uh, to scale up some of these uh, investments and, and, and initiatives, we have to understand the context and we have to understand which models, uh, the different types that I showed you, which are most appropriate in the different cases. Uh, we need to develop the capacity at, at many different levels. Um, and then it's, it's important that the smallholders are taken seriously. And, and I think we have to change some, the mindset and just providing technology in terms of pumps and, and, and drills, drilling equipment and so on to provide, uh, to, in, to enable the farmers through credits, through other uh, means, uh, knowledge, et cetera, because all of these things have to come together. Um, and then we have to think of groundwater irrigation in a broader sense. So how can we uh, maintain the resource by also thinking of, of conjunctive use? Uh, maybe use groundwater downstream of uh, surface water schemes where there's sometimes uh, water locking and so on downstream of uh, big major dams or something like that could be thought of. Uh, like I said, to try to capture some of the flood waters by simple means. It's something that has only very uh, recently and only at a small scale been looked at in, in Africa. How, how are they linked to ecosystem services? How can we uh, use ecosystem services and also protect them by using groundwater? And then the climate change adaptation, because groundwater is an obvious way of, of adaptation, but we need to ensure that other users are not compromised. And then the gender equity, I also mentioned that, and, uh, and the food security is something we need to look more into. 
Okay, I put a couple of slides with the with the papers and the literature that we've used, but other than that, I think this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, very, very comprehensive.